Hello everybody and welcome to Chop and Brew. I am your host and video nerd, Chip Walton. This episode is a year in the making. We're about to take a full circle journey. One year ago this month I was in Pittsburgh and I documented a collaborative brew day with members of the Trash Homebrew Club. That is Three Rivers Alliance of Serious Homebrewers. For the record, serious. So what's about to happen here is very legit. The Trash Club members and I brew up a Michael Dawson stamped and approved Doppelbach built specifically for aging one year before entering into two different homebrew competitions. That beer, which we dubbed Choppinator Choppelbach, took third place in this year's NHC first round and won a gold medal at Beer and Sweat Keg Only competition. We're about to rewind back to October 2014 for the Brew Day in Pennsylvania. Then we're coming back to the future where I'll be joined by Michael Dawson for a tasting note session on the beer. Before we do all of that, I want to take a minute real quick to give a shout out to all of the fans, all of the guests of Chop and Brew, and all of my co-hosts and contributors to help push this thing past 40 episodes. This is episode 41. It's awesome to see. Kind of never would have thought we would have got this far, but I appreciate everybody's patience keeping up with the frequent and infrequent postings. Don't forget you can support Chop and Brew by going to the website and clicking Chop and Brew Online Superstore. We got shirts, beanies, buttons, stickers, cutting boards. We've even got a brew day bundle on there to kind of put a bunch of them together, save on some shipping. Um, also, Brew Your Own Magazine offers 50% back to Chop and Brew when you new subscription or renew subscription through the link on our website. That is under contribute to CMB and then hit sponsors. Okay, so enough of the self-promoting plug. Just want to give a shout out and thanks to everyone who's helped. Now let's fine tune our flux capacitors because we are going back in time. What's going on everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I'm Chip Walton. Today we are brewing for the future. We're in a backyard in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with Malcolm Fraser. Jack Smith and Greg Bender. These guys are members of the Homebrew Club's Trash and Trube in the Pittsburgh area. Today we laid the smack down on an epic Doppelbach. It's a really big beer, really fun time. A couple of interesting things happened on this brew day that we're going to get into on the other side of the title card. So until then, <laughs> chop for chop. And brew, brew for, for brew. brew. Whoop whoop. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, click, click. Oh, 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 okay. There we go. So yes indeed, it's the end of a long brew day. We started this brew day with coffee and the sun on that side of the house. We're ending it with sour beers and the sun like has disappeared. So how long was the brew day? I don't know, it was a good eight, nine hours long. Okay. Pretty long. We're at Jack's house, he was nice enough to host us. Uh, tell us about the Doppelbach, why the Doppelbach, where the recipe came from. So this was a beer that was built to be big and aged to be poured next year at two different events. One of them is next August, Beer and Sweat, Cincinnati, Ohio. And then the other one is next October, Brewing Up a Cure, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, this year's Brewing Up a Cure was actually yesterday. So this beer is gonna age a full year and be served at that event next year. Why we chose a Doppelbach? We thought about some you know, large beers that would age that long and everybody does barley wines, Russian Imperial Stouts. We wanna do something a little different. Yeah. And how we got the recipe? Well, <laughs> Chip knows this guy you might have heard of. His name is Mike Dawson. Mike Dawson. He knows how to make recipes. Yeah. He made us a recipe. And he took into consideration the longevity of the aging he did. as well. Yeah. So he made it a little big. He made it a little big. He used mostly Munich malt, all Munich malt pretty much, with a few additional grains, but the base is all Munich. It's a big beer. And uh, it was also designed for to be decocted. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you remember Michael, the the lore of Michael Dawson, if you have, uh, if you're going to do decoctions, it's based on the number of dogs you have in your yard. So right. we only had one dog today, this Miss Cookie. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we did a single decoction. Tell me about the the overall brew day. How did it go? Well, it was long. That much is for sure. Yeah. 
Um, but it went smooth. Mm -hmm. I don't think we ran into really any issues. Yeah. Um, well, we did run into one gravity, fairly significant issue. Um, we actually overshot our original gravity, but we were able to, to, to correct for that on the fly. No issues. In the end, we overshot our final gravity by two points. Mm -hmm. So it all worked out pretty well. We had about 37 pounds of grain, and at two quarts per pound, which is a good water to grist ratio for decoction mashes, I was worried that my mash ton, even though it can hold about 18 gallons, was worried it would be overflowing at that rate. So we doed in at a normal 1.3 quarts per pound, and then started adding more hot liquor till we filled up the mash tun. So yeah. we're probably at two quarts per pound, but it doesn't really matter. Right. So once that was doed in and we rested for a couple minutes, uh, we started pulling off quarts of thick mash to decoct. quarts total we did we pulled off 20 quarts yeah. um, if we were doing what Mike told us to do in a previous episode of a brewing television show <laughs> we uh, would have probably pulled off something more like 50 or 60 quarts but mm -hmm. there was no way my kettle was gonna fit that so we pulled off until the kettle was full enough that we could stir without it overflowing right um, what's uh, what's the purpose of decocting traditionally and currently well, you, uh, well, traditionally, there was a uh, lesser modified malt, so you took advantage of uh, extracting or activating various enzymes up through the process, and uh, you could end up with a more fermentable and uh, lower final gravity, le more fermentable wort and lower final mm -hmm. gravity. But it also has other benefits, such as developing melanoidins, uh, rich flavor compounds reminiscent of dark bread and, and, and some caramelized type sugars. And haters. Who are gonna hate? Of yeah, course, I, I think they get paid by the for it. yeah they get paid by mm -hmm. the hour for it. Um, a lot of people say it's stupid, it's dumb, it's unnecessary. But with a lot of great processes in home brewing, it's not so much about the need to do it, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. Sure. Yeah, it's definitely about the desire to do it. Um, this wasn't my first time doing a decoction. I've done a handful of them before. Um, they are long. They take a long time. They're a lot of effort. They're a lot of work. Um, some people say there's negligible benefit to doing it. Um, I disagree with that. I feel that beers that are decocted are somehow different, better or worse, I don't know, but different than ones that are not decocted. Yeah. And in the case of this beer we did today, where we boiled this big wad of Munich malt for a half an hour, mm -hmm. we have proof that there is actually the least visual difference between the beer. Yeah. And then we tasted them as well. <laughs> yeah. we this, was, this was my first decoction. I was really yeah. excited to get to try yeah. them side by side, and the decocted mash was delicious. Yeah, it was dramatically darker. Mm -hmm. darker. Uh, yeah. It was. It, it does result in a much longer brew day, but uh, part of the, the fun of brewing is socialization. So we got to hang out with friends all day, <laughs> talked about beer, drank some beers, and filmed some beers. We did mm -hmm. get to talk a lot longer mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because of it. Um, Chip is now an official uh, Pennsylvania resident. Yeah, <laughs> and that. Um, <laughs> we pulled a little sample of both matches. The one that was decocted to me was just so much more richer. I mean, you could see it, it's much, it looked like gravy, it looked like sweet barley gravy. Mm -hmm. The unmashed looked like liquid with solids floating in it. Mm -hmm. I think you're definitely pulling out more sugars and you're making them richer and dense. It was almost like cream to coffee, uh, half and half to coffee as opposed to like 1% to coffee. But. I pull off the decoction sample, you can see it's much darker. I uh, taste it. It actually tastes like a, like a malt syrup, it's uh, really sweet, it has like a dark, uh, Barley syrup taste. If you ever cooked with it, barley syrup, you can uh, definitely taste what I guess melanoidins. Jack, what did this other one get up to? The non decocted sample was it 133, 135? We held it at 135. So this is at 135 the whole time. It's much lighter. Uh, you taste it. It still has a slightly starchy flavor, um, and even the mouthfeel is, is grittier. Uh, Still nice, but nowhere near as sweet, nowhere near as concentrated flavors. So you're boiling it, right? Which you also always hear is bad. You're boiling grains. Oh, it's all tannic. It was very tannic in the end. <laughs> and we also had a lot of hot side aeration. You can see it. Oh man, that hot side aeration, I'll get you. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, if anybody's, it's a long grueling process though, right? Yes, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's it nice to have it's a group. And we just did a single decoction. Yeah. Yeah. I've done triple decoctions 
And so that's a 3x long grueling process. Mm -hmm. But even having been through it several times, I'll still do it in the future because mm -hmm. it's fun to me. It, helps, it does yeah. help to have multiple people to help stir. I mean, yeah. Yeah, everyone took a turn, yeah. even uh, Chip here. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Major caveat to that is I won't do them alone. So yeah. you get the decocted mash back into the main mash, and from there it's a pretty basic brew day. Is there any? From that point forward, so you're you're you're, you're, you're mashing and you've got your mash running a little low. In our instance, it was 135 degrees. We pulled off the decoction, and we after that was done being boiled and we added it back. Our main mash was at 156, which is sort of a higher end sacrification rex. So, so from that point forward, it rested for 45 minutes. We sparged, we lowdered, we boiled, Brude was done. Yeah, we were trying to make a traditional German beer. So we went with an all Weyermann malt bill to kind of put us in that place and that time, that terroir. And I seriously think that that's part of why that decoction got so rich, gravy-like, creamy. It just, there's good, quality malts and sugars hiding out in there. I agree, I agree. I have some other Munich malt on hand that I was planning to use, and then when I tasted that besides the Weyermann malt that we got our hands on, just two in the grain, Absolutely. Weyermann just tasted so much better. Yeah. Whether or not it's a, you know, actually a better quality malt, but the flavor profile to me was what you need to make this kind we of We also beer. found it was kind of interesting is that that care aroma, that grain was pretty, pretty different. I mean, it was like a mix between a pale chocolate and uh, what we say, special B. Special B and pale it had chocolate. A, it had like a raisiny anise character with a nice pale chocolate aroma and flavor. And yeah. it was such a small amount. I mean, for 37 whatever pounds. 12, 12 less, ounces. 12 yeah. ounces, yeah. What hops did you go? Oh, we first worked hops. Did, did, did. We did. Yeah. <laughs> we did. Malcolm in the Middle Fruit. Yeah. Malcolm <laughs> in the Middle Fruit. Yeah. So we first worked hopped this beer at Michael's suggestion. A lot of debate around the brew <laughs> station as we waited for it these. It was discussion. It wasn't yeah. debate. It was, yeah. it was discussion. It was a nerd out. Yeah. It was a nerd out. We, we pondered whether or not first wort hops do anything beyond regular boil hops. And Dawson even texted us back some details saying that you get a, a higher um, utilization rate. And the hop oils kind of blend with the proteins in that weird kind of pre-boil state to do something together that doesn't actually get boiled off so you're accentuating flavors. I think the debate will continue. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, I think we're on board with the utilization. I mean, it's, it's more heat uh, exposure to the uh, alpha acid, so more isomerization. Uh, it's, it's the aroma thing, you know, and it was a good discussion and I thank uh, Dawson for replying and we'll look into it. My, my concern was about is you hear a lot of people repeating, you should first word hop because you get a smoother bitterness, a mm -hmm. less harsh bitterness. And I, you know, I've done first word hopping and not, I haven't done side by side batches of the same beer where that's the only variable, but to me, I haven't noticed a difference in smoothness of the, of the bitterness. But, uh, so we asked Mike what, what was his reason for doing that? And the bitterness was not in his response. He had other reasons for doing it. Right. I think it's the other part of the character of hops well beyond the bitterness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty regular brew day till the end. I was kind of, I've never seen, um, the kind of pre-chill, explain the pre-chill method right. that you guys had going on. Yeah, that was something that I've never done before. This is a lager, so I wanted to pitch at 50 degrees. Um, what I normally do is chill into the upper 60s and then put my, my wort in the fermentation chamber and let it get it down into about the 50 degree range and then I'll pitch my yeast the next morning. I've never had an issue doing that, but I just wanted to try getting it to lager temperatures quicker. So um, I got asked Andy, Greg, and. Malcolm, does anybody have an immersion chiller? And if you do, can you bring that in a sack of ice and we'll run it, run our chill water through it as a pre-chill. Worked pretty well. It went through the immersion chiller before going into the, into the counter flow chiller. So we were just sending very cold water. Took about what, total 25 minutes maybe? We got down to about 75 degrees in like 10 minutes. We weren't timing it, but it was quick. And then the last down into, we got it down to 55. We got it to there, it probably took another 10 to 12 minutes on top of that. And not only did uh, did that work out okay, and we filled up two carboys, but because you had that extra volume at the beginning, we had to top it off with a little water pre-boil, because we were sitting at like, what? A, we were close to our expected fin final gravity. No, we were at 1100 as we checked the runnings about halfway through, okay. which was further ahead than where we should be. It was at that point we knew we might have a little bit of a problem on our gravity. Yeah. But overshooting your gravity is definitely better than undershooting your gravity. Mm -hmm. So when we were done, when we had collected our pre-boil volume, we were about one point shy of our expected final gravity. So uh, 
we added some water at that point, mm -hmm. which meant that we had an extra gallon of wort at the end. Yeah, so as you can see, he poured two carboys full, and then he racked the last little tiny bit into a baby jug. Little tip, always have some kind of sanitized smaller vessel, because if that happens, you don't want to just pour it down the drain. No, right? it's right. perfectly good wort. It's no different than the wort that goes yeah. into the other. Could vessel. be used as a starter, could be used as an experiment, which is what Jack's going to do. Right. Yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah, right now we have in our glasses, we have a nice little, shared a nice bottle of uh, La, La Roja from Jolly Pumpkin Brewery up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, it's a pretty nice amber sour beer. Um, and because it's a live ale full of yeast, bugs, dregs in the bottle, I'm going to throw that into the one gallon of extra wort. See what happens. It's a pretty strong amber colored wort at this point. It's not a lager yet, it's just wort. So we'll throw this in and see if we can make ourselves a nice little strong sour ale. So final product, what's your prognosis for this beer? It's going to be good. It's going to be a good beer. We have a great big huge starter waiting for us. Three big <laughs> smack packs into a two liter starter, which was then ramped up to a 4.5 liter starter because I need a lot of yeast for 10 gallons of 1090 lager. Right. Um, according to the yeast calculator I used online, I needed 1.2 trillion cells of yeast, and that starter gave me about 1 trillion cells. So I'm a little short even still with all that. So this will be fermented uh, at 50 degrees, just a straight old lager ferment, a good two minutes of oxygen into each carboy. Pitched at 48, allowed to free rise to 50. It will ferment at 50 until it's about three quarters of the way done fermenting, then I'll start warming it up. Probably hit mid 60s by the time it's done warming it up. It'll sit there for a week or two. That'll make sure that all the diacetyl's gone out of the beer. At that point, I'll probably crash it down to very near to freezing, rack it into a secondary fermenter. Uh, if there's any headspace, I'll purge that with some CO2, try to protect the beer and put that into a refrigerator that I keep very cold right around freezing. And uh, it'll sit there for until I need the fridge space because this beer is not going anywhere until next summer. Well, it's been 30 minutes. Oh, that's our timer. We have to get off camera. That really means we're about to run out of card. So <laughs> it's getting dark. It's 108 minutes on Lost. Yeah, push the button. It's getting dark. <laughs> it's getting late. It's been a long day. I want to thank Malcolm, Jack, Gregor, Mrs. Smith off camera, Dana off camera. They've been <laughs> they've been shooting rocks at us from afar. Andy Weigel went home. Andy Weigel for coming out. Uh, thanks, True Trash, for having me up here for this epic brew day. Can't wait to taste it. I, I'm either gonna come up for beer and sweat, or you're gonna send me and Dawson a bottle, maybe. Or both. Or both. both. All three of the above. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say except I think I have faith that this beer is gonna be awesome because there were so many awesome people involved in it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course it's going to be awesome. I mean, we brewed it, right? Yep. I don't brew bad beer, except when I do. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we should have had your wife involved. <laughs> <laughs> All right, till the next time. Chop for chop. Brew, brew for brew. brew. In the dark. All right. Brew for dark. I'm empty. I need some more beer. <laughs> Slam that sour beer. Uh, Woo! Fast forward to October 2000. 15 on my front porch in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm here with the architect of the Choppinator Choppelbach, Michael Dawson. I just wrote down some numbers. Jack and crew did all the hard work and won a gold medal. Won a gold medal. The beer, they were brewing four beer and sweat, keg only, homebrew competition, took a gold in the Bach category. So Michael Dawson clearly knew what he was doing when he just wrote down some numbers for a Doppelbach recipe that would be good one year after aging. But the execution was clutch. It's truth. You know, when Jack asks you, I want a Doppelbach that can hold for a year, what's the difference of the way you would brew that and you'd brew a Doppelbach that you want ready in a month or whatever smaller window? Honestly, I scaled up a recipe that I had done before. I made it a little bit bigger, um, slight bit hoppier, a um, little bit more dark malt. Uh, just to kind of give it some extra oomph, some extra antioxidant and aging power. Uh, and I think it really paid off. This is a really, really great beer. One year on, it's held up really well. Yeah. Uh, this is a keg fill. Jack sent us two bottles. Thankfully, he filled those before he went to uh, Beer and Sweat because I was led to believe that it was like gone. It was out of there really quick. Metal or not, people loved this beer. So what are you getting out of the beer? So you had mentioned that keg fill, right? And we both commented on low CO2 level. 
which may be a function of the keg fill, right? But yeah. what I kind of like about that is that it really enhances the uh, just really creamy, unctuous mouthfeel of this beer. It's almost liqueurish. Um, Dogs got a scratch, man. Dogs, Dogs got, got a scratch. scratch. There's just uh, this wonderful kind of fruitcake ethanol nose to this beer. It's like a rum-soaked fruitcake. Uh, yeah. It's really dark, dense, aromatic, pungent, raisiny, treacly, with a definite spicy alcohol note to it, and that follows through with the flavor. Uh, it's just really big, malty, rich, um, toffee-ish, creamy. Um, don't really get a lot of oxidation out of it, mm -mm. Um, or, or any other... Uh, negative effects of, of a one-year-old beer. Yeah, I got dark bread, specifically raisin bread mm -hmm. that's been toasted. Mm -hmm. Burnt caramelized sugar, a little boozy slickness. It's not mm -hmm. heat on the flavor. It's more of a <laughs> an ephemeral. It's a mouthfeel, and then it's definitely kind of a, a brainwave mm -hmm. <laughs> detector. Feeling the brain waves for sure. Yeah, uh, Elsa's mom even got just a slight bit of smoke out of it, which there's no smoke malt in it, but... Um, and then a good friend of ours, Bob, said raisinets. Kind of chocolate-covered raisins mm -hmm. or of some sort. Mm -hmm. I will note that it pairs well with Oreo cupcakes. Um, the sweetness of the cupcake plays up the malt, hop, acidity of the beer. We had some uh, Oreo cupcakes a couple weeks ago when we drank the first bottle, and it was surprisingly good. It sounds pretty good. <laughs> I know. I'm sure it's supposed to be paired with something a little more like Wild Game or Bratwurst or something, but I was like, what about a cheap Oreo cupcake from Cub Foods? It's pretty wild to me, man. Yeah. Really clean, too. Like, there's no uh, fusils, there's no harshness to the alcohol quality. Um, it's just, it's very smooth, very very maybe too easy to drink yeah a year man <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to not touch a beer for a year i think that deserves a little shout out to the trash crew blam 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 sporting the colors i am um, i can wear this shirt today and then again at my own funeral <laughs> <laughs> repping your set mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thanks for coming by. Thanks to Jack for sending it to us. Yeah. <laughs> chop a chop. Brew for brew. Chop a nator. Brew a nator. There we go. What's up with this motorcycle gang across the street? Don't make eye contact. It's just a gang of one. It's a lone wolf. Come on, homie. Trying to make a video up in here. Haven't you heard of craft beer? What's going on everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I'm Chip Walton. I am being joined in a backyard outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania by... <clears throat> Malcolm Fraser. Okay, uh, what, where are we? Baden? Welcome to Chop and Brew everybody. I am Chip Walton. I'm doing a mic check while I watch people walk by on the street and they're looking at me because I'm wearing candy cane pajama pants on my front porch and it's noon. So what's up? Beagle time. Beagle time. I really don't think he should be in your lap when you're doing that. I know he's blocking the shirt, right? So, God. Well, we both noted that um, dogs are going to bark. We've both noted that dogs are going to bark. Maybe not. Jack Smith's mission was a success. Mission accomplished. Dogs are getting angry. Hey! We really shouldn't have the dogs in here. <laughs> you got people walking down your neighborhood. Otherwise, I mean, how would we know that? I know. If the dogs didn't let us know. <laughs> 
do we leave it in or start over? Let's start over. Okay. So yeah, um, a year later, you can't kick the chair, no. <laughs> We're you not, gotta be totally still. We're never gonna get this done. <laughs> it's so funny. There's two guys drinking beer. How hard can this be? <laughs> so the plan worked. The man with the plan is now on the stand. <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> I think we should just do all that over. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're I'm getting. I'm sorry. No, we're getting. <laughs> this is a strong beer. <laughs> Was that okay, Nev? Did we do okay? Did we do a good. Yeah. Yeah, we, you did a great job. Yeah? I can't believe we got that far. I can't believe it either. <laughs> only, you gotta, Last yeah. time we had to start over. That was so amazing. You got to <laughs> yell cut. There's only one official thing. <laughs> Charlie, come on. I can't see your dog. You got to yell. Yeah, if we're all done, you can yell cut.